Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. This is Burke Park, and you're listening to the SA Matters Radio Show with Rich Gassaway. The SA Matters mission is simple. They want to help us see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. Oh, the safe to dance. Hey, it's safe to dance. Hello and welcome to episode 74 of the Situational Awareness Matters radio show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high risk, high consequence environments. The SA Matters mission is simple, to help you see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. If you've experienced or witnessed the near miss, and would like to have a platform to share your lessons learned with others, please contact me by visiting the essaymatters.com website and clicking on the Contact Us link on the top of the home page. Think about it. Your lessons learned from a close call could save someone else's life. If you want to share your experience, contact me. I'm coming to you today from Emmitsburg, Maryland, where I just finished delivering a presentation for the National Fire Academy's Executive Fire Officer Program Graduate Symposium. This 20-minute TEDx-inspired presentation, the National Fire Academy calls Chuck Chats, after the now-retired Executive Fire Officer Program Chair Chuck Burkell. The topic I presented on is called Creating the Thinking Firefighter. It was a short presentation, but it makes a powerful and compelling argument that in many casualty incidents, firefighters are not thinking. Rather, they're acting in automatic formation based on training. I'll share how we can change the way we conduct our training to create thinking firefighters. Think, then decide, then act. That's an idea worth sharing. I recorded the presentation and I wanted to share it with you here on the radio show. So this episode is dedicated to creating the thinking firefighter. I also broadcasted the episode or the uh, presentation live using the Periscope app. If you're not familiar with the app, it allows someone to give a live presentation or really talk live about anything they want to via the app Periscope. Those who are following the presenter, and for me that would be at Rich Gassaway, the same as my Twitter handle, can watch presentations live. Those who follow the presenter but miss the presentation that's live can watch replays of it. If you want to learn more, just Google Periscope app and learn how to download that. You may want to follow me using Periscope because I intend to send out lessons on situational awareness through live video presentations on Periscope on a regular basis. I think it's just a great way to give away some free training. So let's jump into the presentation on creating thinking firefighters. We're doing it wrong. We're doing it wrong. It was 2006. And I had given an opportunity to give a a presentation at a conference in Florida. And then I went to Washington State and gave another presentation based on the research that I was doing for my PhD. And then I came to Maryland. When I came to Maryland, I met with three of what I consider the smartest people in the fire service. Dr. Dennis O'Neill, Dr. Kirby Kiefer, and Dr. Cortez Lawrence. I tapped them to give me some advice and guidance on the research that I was doing and how it could benefit the fire service. And we had a wonderful meeting. It was at Dr. Kiefer's house. 
And then I went to California and I gave a presentation, or not a, as a presentation, but I attended a conference of brain researchers trying to learn how we make decisions when we're working in high stress, high consequence environments. Then I came home and I went to bed. I was tired. I traveled across four time zones over the course of that week and a half. And I was in bed and it was 2.43 in the morning. And I woke up and I sat straight up out of bed. And I said, we're doing it wrong. We're doing it wrong. I said it so loud I woke my wife up. She put her hand on my shoulder and she said, Rich, we have four kids, we're not doing it wrong. <laughs> I said, no, no, Carol, not we're doing it wrong. In the fire service, we're doing it wrong. And right there, on my bedroom wall, came an envisionment of how I had been training firefighters wrong for my whole career. Man, I was so disturbed by this. I got up out of bed, I went to my dining room, I sat down with a notepad and I started writing down all the ways that I had been doing it wrong as an instructor. It wasn't that I was teaching firefighters the wrong thing, telling them the wrong thing than when we were on the drill ground. It was the fact that I was telling them what to do on the drill ground to begin with. You see, I shouldn't have been... By the time I got him through the classroom training and got him onto the drill ground, I shouldn't have been telling them what to do. I should have been asking them what to do. And I wasn't doing this. The training scenarios would go something like this. All right, crew, you guys ready to go? All suited up? Hose lines are laid, burn building, the fire's in the burn building. I'm going to go in and check on the fire. I'm going to come back and check, and I'll get you guys. And I'd go in, and I'd make sure the fire was getting stoked right, and I'd come back, and I'd say, you guys ready to go? You ready? Yeah, you ready? Okay, let's go, let's go. Go, 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 go. Watch the stand on the left-hand wall. Stay down low. Watch the fire growth. We've all been involved in that drill. What a mistake. What a mistake. You see what I should have done? And for the instructors out there, or for the chiefs to take this message back to your instructors, try this drill. Hey guys, I'll be back in a minute. I'm going to go check on the fire. And once I get it, make sure it's ready to go. Then I'll come back and get you guys. Go check on the fire. Come back to the front. Go, okay, you guys ready to go? Yeah, we're ready to go. Okay, you think you should go in? Huh? You're trying to trick me, aren't you? What do you mean, do we think we should go in? Hell yeah, we should go in. That's what we're here for. That's the drill today. Interior fire attack. We're going in. You'd be surprised how many company officers I've talked to that in this training, when they're ready to go in, the instructor comes to the door and the instructor says, you guys ready to go? Yeah, okay, let's go. And when that happens... It seems so innocent, but when it happens, what the instructor has done is rob that crew and that company officer of the opportunity to make the first and most critical decision that that crew is going to make at a real fire. Go or no go. The decision seemingly is pre-programmed in the training environment. It's go. In fact, it's go every single time. We never don't go in the training environment. The program decision is go. You know, a decision, the definition of a decision is a choice among alternatives. If we have no alternatives, we have no decision to make. If the company officer in the training environment gets no opportunity to make the decision, 
They cannot possibly be a critical thinker. All they're doing is following the instructions of the instructor as I, the instructor, had told them to do. I challenge you to think about this in your own training and how your department's doing their training. How many times, before I get to the question, two of the leading ways that firefighters die in the act of structural firefighting at residential fires are building collapse and flashover. Now there are many ways a firefighter can die inside of a fire, but if you look at the data, of the announcements of firefighters dying in the act of firefighting in residential fires, you see collapse and flashover high up on the list. Now we know when we're training the firefighters in the classroom, we're telling the firefighters the importance of doing a 360 degree size up. We're teaching the firefighters the importance of building construction and decomposition. And we're teaching firefighters about fire behavior and smoke, color, volume, velocity, density, flames, and flame movement, and flow path. And we teach all that in the classroom, and then we go out to the drill ground, and we focus on the hands-on skills. In the classroom, we teach the cognitive, the what do I need to know, when do I need to know it, why do I need to know it. In the field, we teach the how. How do I do it? The kinesthetic, the muscle movement that makes the action occur that accomplishes the task. But somehow in the field, we miss tying the cognitive and the kinesthetic together. And we focus on the how to put the fire out. And somehow miss the opportunity to teach the decision making of should we be in that fire at all. Think about your own training. I think about the training that I've done, how many times I've trained firefighters the wrong way. When I was at the burn building, we never, ever did a 360 degree walk around the burn building. The firefighters had the hose lines laid, they were suited up, they were ready to go in. I, the instructor, come to the door, you ready to go in? Okay, let's go. We already discussed that I robbed them of the opportunity to make their go or no go decision. And I denied them the opportunity to do a 360 degree size up. We know at a fire, we want a firefighting crew to do, at least the officer, to do a 360 size up prior to entry. We teach it, we drill it, and yet when you read the firefighter fatality reports, how many fatality reports list a contributing factor of no 360 size up or improper size up prior to engagement that would have given the indicators that they were heading into a bad situation. Look at the reports yourself. You will see it. I'll ask a company officer, when, before you went in on your fire attack, did the instructor have you do a 360 size up? No. But in a real fire you do a 360 size up, right? Yep. Would you? You know we're creatures of habit. And there's no environment where you're more a creature of habit than when you're under stress. And when you're under stress, you do things that are automatic based on our training. How many times I've looked at videos or read case studies and said to myself, What were they thinking? They weren't thinking. They were performing an automatic lockstep fashion based on how we have trained them. Take the hose line, go inside, no 360. Think about the drill grounds that we've done that on. Every once in a while, I'll get the, I'll get the officer who say, no, 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 in our department, we do a 360 around the burn building every single time. I want to hug those people. I say, okay, when you're doing the 360 around the burn building, what are you looking for? Are you looking for signs of building collapse? In fact, I'll ask the officer and even the firefighters on his crew, before you made entry into that burn building that was made of concrete or steel, were you worried that your burn building was going to fall down and kill you while you were in 
your burn building. Now every once in a while I get a yes because the quality of the burn building maintenance has not been up to par. But almost always I get no. No concern at all. So what you're telling me is in the training environment before you made entry, the thought of structural collapse was nowhere in your thought process. Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. And then I ask him, is that what you would want on a real fire ground? No concern at all for building collapse? No, I'd want to be concerned. Well, then the concern needs to be there on the training ground too. And you need to be assessing the potential of building collapse. Before you made entry into the burn building, did you have any concern for flashover? Huh? No. We're burning paper and hay and maybe a pallet. Maybe even propane. It's not going to flash over. There's no heavy hydrocarbon load filling it up with a heavy, thick, black, angry, mean smoke that's going to heat up all the contents and lead to the flashover. No! I had no concern of flashover in the burn building environment. Well, is that the mindset you want to have before you make an entry into a real residential dwelling fire? No concern for flashover? And we quickly see the meltdown in the training process that I had conducted. I told them what to do, denying them of their go or no-go decision. I didn't have them do a 360. They had no concern for building collapse, no concern for flashover. The focus was entirely on the kinesthetic muscle movement, advance the hose line, left wall, count the walls, get to the seat of the fire, and knock it down. It seems kind of tragic now as I look back on it. I asked the officer, when you were getting ready to make your entry, what size hose line did you take in to the burn building? Uh, inch and three quarter. Okay. Why not a two and a half? Well, there was no two and a half there. So the only line on the ground was an inch and three quarter. Well, there might have been another inch and three quarter backup for the instructor in case something went wrong. Okay, so you took the line that was on the ground, the inch and three quarter, and advanced it into the burning building to put the fire out. Yep. Well, you were denied the opportunity to make the second most critical decision at the scene of that fire. We've established I've already denied you the first the go or no go. Now I've denied you the second, your hose line selection and your hose line placement. You see, if the only line on the ground is an inch and three quarter, there's no decision to be made. A decision is a choice among alternatives. And if I want to create a thinking firefighter, I need to give that firefighter a choice. Here's an inch and three quarter, here's a two and a half, here's a deck gun. Which should you use in this scenario? and let them decide. You see, I said one of my biggest mistakes was I told firefighters what to do. If I got firefighters ready to the point where they're going to go in with, with under the leadership of a company officer, I shouldn't be telling them what to do at all. I should be deploying the Socratic method of teaching and invert the lesson in the form of a question come to the front door and say, okay, you guys ready? Yeah, we're ready. Well, what do you think you should do? You know the answer is going to be go. And then you're going to say, go? Are you sure? Based on what criteria? Under, describe the smoke and fire conditions, building construction, decomposition, speed of conditions changing that allowing you to make that go decision. You're going to stand that officer still in their tracks because they're not going to be able to answer the question. Because we haven't trained them on how to first think, then decide, then, as the third thing, act. We jump right to act. Take the line, go. Take the line, go. Same with the, same with the rescue drill. We take firefighters on a search drill. Hey, we got a rescue Randy inside, the building's on fire. Ready to go? Yeah. All right, let's go, 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 go. 
Is there the possibility that we could arrive on the scene of a fire with a victim inside, a fire that we should not go in because the victim is already unsavable? The default in the search and rescue drill is go every single time. Not only do we go every single time, but we go until we find Randy and we bring Randy out and we rescue him. That's what I call the Hollywood ending to the search and rescue drill. We're successful every single time. We create vertical roof ventilation evolutions. Send firefighters to the roofs doing vertical ventilation in practice, in training. Today's drill, vertical ventilation. You guys ready? Okay, up they go. Chop, chop, chop. Saw, saw, saw. At not one time have I ever asked the vertical ventilation crew, you guys ready? Yeah. So you think you should go to the roof or not? Huh? Not go? That's the drill. We're going every time. But we shouldn't go every time. I was recently having a conversation with the chief of the department. He's full of a lot of angst right now because he had a very close call on an on a incident where a crew was on a roof that they should not have been on the roof. And I was talking with him and he said, you know, we're getting ready to do discipline. We're getting ready to discipline the officer for making a bad decision. I said, I would like to discourage you from using discipline as a means by which to change behavior and to teach. And I'm further going to discourage you from doing that by asking you, Chief, in the drill ground evolutions, was that officer ever trained on how to make the decision not to go to the roof in the training scenario? And he looked like he had seen a ghost. He said, no, on the training scenario, we go every time. I said, well, then don't be surprised on the fire ground when they go every time. It's what we do. That's the answer I hear. It's what we do. We need to train firefighters on how to first think, then how to make a decision, and then how to discern the decision into action. Now, I only had 20 minutes to try to convince you that the way we're training is wrong. I think that's probably a little presumptuous on my part that I could find success in such a short amount of time. But I'd like to give you the opportunity to carry on the conversation with me more and, uh, and visit my website for situational awareness, samatters.com. Click on the contact me link and ask me your questions and let me know how, and I'll take a few questions here. If I'm recording a video of this presentation, if you want the video so you can replay it, re-listen, show it to somebody, just drop your business card off down here on the stage and on the back of your business card just write video and I'll send you the video. If you want me to follow up with you on the back of your business card just write F you. <laughs> For follow-up. For follow-up. Unless you didn't like the program, then you can spell it out. We have to teach firefighters and company officers how to make decisions. We have to teach them hands-on actions. And then we have to make sure that when they're doing the hands-on, they're first thinking, then deciding, and then acting. That's an idea worth sharing. Thank you. Before I close out today's episode, I want to take a moment to thank the departments and the organizations who've hosted recent Situational Awareness Matters tour stops. Your efforts to bring this valuable and powerful training on situational awareness and high-risk, high-consequence decision-making to your members and others in your region are greatly appreciated. In August, I was at the Fire Rescue International Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, where I delivered four programs on situational awareness, high-risk decision-making, and training for failure. And then, of course, today, September 10th, I'm on the campus of the National Fire Academy presenting at the Executive Fire Officer Graduate Symposium, a Chuck Chat, Creating the Thinking Firefighter. If you're interested in joining me in an upcoming tour stop, you can catch me at the following locations. 
Well, by the time this episode airs, these next two will have occurred. September 12th, Plainfield Fire Department in Michigan. September 14th, Bloomfield Township Fire Department in Michigan. September 23rd, I'll be at Fire Rescue Canada. That's the conference for the Canadian Fire Chiefs Association. I'll be giving the closing keynote at their conference in Victoria, British Columbia. September 26th, I'll be at the Delran, New Jersey Fire Department. September 28th, the Ontario Fire College in Gravenhurst, Ontario. October 2 and 3, the Champions Fire Protection District in Houston, Texas. October 7th, Fire Shows West in Reno, Nevada. I'll be giving the keynote address there. October 9th, the New Hampshire Fire Chiefs Association in Concord, New Hampshire. October 14 and 15, the Pierland Fire Department in Pierland, Texas. October 20th, the Association of Air Medical Transport Conference in Long Beach, California. October 22nd, the Emergency Preparedness and Hazardous Materials Conference in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. October 26 and 27, the Hampton Roads Fire Chiefs Association in the Hampton Roads, Virginia area. And October 29th, the Tennessee Homeland Security in Knoxville, Tennessee. If you're interested in attending an upcoming Situational Awareness Matters tour stop, head over to the SA Matters website and click on the blue box on the right side of the homepage labeled Upcoming Events Schedule. Here's hoping there's a tour stop near you and we'll get a chance to meet up. If you're interested in adding your department or association to the lineup of tour stops, contact me through the website and we'll get something set up for you. If you're not a member of the SA Matters community of learners yet, please consider joining. There are more than 5,000 members connected on the SA Matters community sharing ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to train members to be critical thinkers and resilient problem solvers. Membership is free. And when you sign up, you'll receive a special report that I've created called 25 Best Practices for Improving First Responder Safety. To sign up, you go to samatters.com and click on the red box on the right side of the home page that says Free Membership. As a reminder, every episode of the SA Matters radio show has a corresponding show notes page on the samatters.com website. The most recent episodes scroll on the home page. But for older episodes, go to samatters.com forward slash and then enter the episode number, which I always mention at the start of each show. So, for example, if you wanted to access episode 60, you'd open up your internet browser, type www.samatters.com forward slash 60, and that'll take you to the page that contains the link to that episode. The show notes page contains additional information and resources about the episode, and depending on who the guest might be, I might also have incident scene pictures, video, and audio, and the contact information for the guest. On the show notes page, you can also ask me questions and leave feedback about the episode. If you want to get connected with me on social media, you can follow at Rich Gassaway or at SA Matters on Twitter. The SA Matters Twitter community has more than 16,000 followers uh, supporting our mission on Twitter. Thanks to all of those who are connected with me there. You might want to consider getting connected with me on the Periscope app by following at Rich Gassaway, and that way you'll get the notifications for the upcoming live free video presentations that are going to be on Periscope. You can also get connected with me on Facebook by liking the SA Matters page, and on LinkedIn you can find me by searching Rich Gassaway on LinkedIn. And thanks to those who've connected with me on Facebook and LinkedIn, I sincerely appreciate that too. If you like the show, please consider going over to iTunes or Stitcher Radio and subscribing. Search for SA Matters Radio. That's SA Matters Radio. Please consider leaving some feedback for me while you're there. And if you like the show, I'd really appreciate it if you'd give it a five-star review. Not only will that motivate me to work harder for you, but it'll also help others find the show. Well, that's it. Episode 74 is complete. Thank you to the United States Fire Administration and the U.S. Fire Administrator Ernie Mitchell, the the National Fire Academy and the Acting Superintendent Kirby Kiefer, and the Executive Fire Officer Program Graduate Symposium Committee for the opportunity to contribute to the success of your symposium. Thank you to our sponsor, Midwest Fire. Thank you to all the live event hosts. And thank you to our listeners for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I sincerely appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. 
You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.